Welcome to Deep Natter. This week, we're talking about recognizing our own good, seeing patterns in the creative chaos of work that we make, and Sean shares some absolutely beautiful thoughts around connectivity and making. Here we go. I just want the headline. Yeah, Sidoris <laughs> jailed for singing Tony Hadley tune. So accurately that it was picked up by the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> they thought I was him. That's all it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mistaken identity. That's what it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that Tony Hadley? No. It's close enough that we have to sue him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I wanted to congratulate you, and I and I completely forgot oh. to, and I'm a, I'm a horrible friend for not doing it. Um... What did I do? Well, just you know, the, the achievement of of doing your own audiobook, recording, producing, releasing the whole thing all solo. It's just it's terrific. I'm so happy for you. I'm so proud of you oh, for getting it out there. You. Yeah, I mean, I, the more I listen back to it, the more I realize you, you're absolutely right. I'm 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 chopping it up too much, and it's it's rushed in a lot of places. Do you think? But I just. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I know why I've done it. I did it because that's how I edit videos. Mm -hmm. It will have a similar pace and tempo. To it, it'll be slower than videos, but it'll have that similar kind of YouTube cutting style. Yeah, but it doesn't. It's not really ideal for an audio book, and I realize I've done that. But again, like that's kind of the best I can do right now, because I, I if it wasn't that, I'd have to re-record the entire thing again. Right. I don't. I don't think I get it right on the second pass either, because. I find that I start chapters slow the way I want, but I just speed up as I go on. And I think it would take a lot of practice to get good at it. And I just don't have that time right now. I have to get it out. So yeah. it has to be done as better than perfect in this case, I think. Well, and sometimes, I mean, I don't know if, if you're like me, you don't necessarily hear it in the moment. You hear it when you, when oh, you yeah. play it back and you're listening. When you're doing it, you think, man, this is going great, right? But then you listen to it back. Yeah, but I've got levels of self-denial with that because I think I, I I did listen to it back a lot, obviously, when I was cutting it. And then I listened through every chapter after I cut it into my ear. It sounded good. Mm -hmm. But the more distance I've got, I'm like, nah, you're right. It's it is too. It doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like other audio books. I, I don't want it to be very slow and plodding. I think some audio books are too uh, slow for me and that, that I, I'm kind of like get on with it you know yeah and I know a lot of people who do listen to audiobooks on one and a half speed right so right, right, right. I'm not uh, I, I think it's a it's a compromise um, with what I can manage right now but yeah I'm not I'm not unhappy with how it sounds oh it sounds and, terrific um, yeah so I'm I'm, I'm uh, yeah and I'm, I've had I've had some orders coming through and people seem to be listening to it and I haven't had anything terribly negative come through immediately so that's good or nothing negative come through yet so that's right good. as long as people are happy with it well and i think that's that's the goal right or that's the benchmark and i think because we are so used to hearing your voice i think that there will be a pretty sizable audience if i'm being honest that will prefer to get the book that way just because we're so used to hearing your voice it, it it feels like the me you're used to hearing for sure, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think that that'll that'll buy me some wiggle room. If I was trying to do a voice of somebody else, I would have screwed up. But I think because that's how I do stuff with videos, it'll feel familiar enough to people, and they'll go, "Okay, yeah, that's that's kind of what I expected," because that's the him that I know from listening to videos. So I th I think I'll get away with it, uh, and I'm not unhappy with it. I just know it could be better. Given the experience with doing this. Could you see yourself doing an audio component for this new project that you're working on? No, not not on its own. I don't I don't think I love audio as a medium, but I don't think it's my world really. I think I'd have to do a lot of but but I but doing my own voiceover for a documentary, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like that that I'd be much more confident doing now. I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Cuz like the Werner Herzog stuff, his documentaries are are so his documentaries because of his voiceover. Right. That's they they feel like him because it's his point of view but spoken through his very unique <laughs> monotone right melancholy Bavarian. Today we are going up yes, this yes. mountain. Yes. Yeah. Death and murder. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, you may not death. survive listening to yes, this. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah. The debauchery and fornication <laughs> of nature. <laughs> like, all, right, all right, buddy. But he's so distinct, you know, and in, in that yes. distinctiveness, he's kind of carved out, you know, his, his own space in, in that genre. I think we underestimate that. Like this, is, it's like somebody, um, somebody's voice and their point of view together as like a as like a disembodied voice. It's 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 almost. I mean, you know this. It's obviously. I think it's more powerful than listening to an interview with somebody. Is just hearing that voice and that very deliberately written. It's it's like that first twenty minutes of that Stephen Fry podcast I suggested to you. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. it's so him, you know. And it, I I prefer just to hear the voice and hear him say that stuff than watch him say it to a crowd in a talk. It's more powerful somehow. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I I mean, I think listening to this audio book back, I'm almost like I love it for what it is. I don't think I'm ever going to get into podcasting for myself or anything like that because it's a really particular thing, but doing voiceover for a documentary where I wrote that voiceover to within an inch of its life. I think that's a similar thing. And I, I do like the the power of that if it's done right. It's really cool. Right. Do you know, that's been one of my, and I, I can't remember whether we've talked about this or not from, from this perspective, but that's been one of my, not fears, but it's, it's certainly one of the reasons I'm reluctant to really lean into YouTube in terms of, of being on camera on YouTube. Because I really do like just the voice. I, I, I really do love listening to people's voices. And I, even to the point where, you know, a lot of times I'll have TV shows or movies on in the background while I'm doing other things and, and listen to them as radio plays because I really do love that experience. And part of me thinks that if I am going to lean into YouTube and I have some ideas of how I'd like to do that. It certainly won't be the way you do it as kind of a, a face with the voice. I, I want to keep my voice almost isolated in a way. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I th- but then you've got the perfect opportunity to do both. So to have that visual element, if it's just hands on a book, right, doing a review, but having it's like listening to a podcast of you because you can't see your face and that's not the important thing. It's just that voice we're used to hearing in podcasts and like iteration monologues and intros but like more extended with a visual element. It's a, it's a very small step into something. Yeah. And that's really exciting to me. Oh yeah. You know, the, the one I did for Carson, uh, I, I did this, this review for David Carson f- for his collage book, his first book of collages. And, you know, I don't have a lot of YouTube subscribers. I have less than a thousand. In fact, if you're listening to this and if you could help me get to a thousand so that I can stream from my phone, that would be great. YouTube has this arbitrary limit, like all of these platforms have these weird limits of when you can unlock certain features. I mean, I've got, I think, 700 and some odd subscribers. But on the back of that, this Carson review has almost 11,000 views, which is, I mean, look, it's nothing compared to what somebody like you gets. But on the back of 700 plus subscribers, 11,000 views is pretty good. It means somebody's sharing it around, yeah. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't like, it doesn't cost you anything to subscribe. So like, like helping a creator like Jeffrey, just, just hit the subscribe button. Even if you, you know, just on YouTube, it just helps push him over that thing, which means you can do more. So right. just take a second to go and, and hit that button would be, would be super helpful. It, yeah, it, it is unfortunate. Great. It's like Instagram had particular things. You can't post links before you get over a certain number of followers and yeah, 10,000 yeah, I mean, really on Instagram. Yeah, it's, it's mad. Yeah. I mean, if you can, if you help creators who you believe in, get over those thresholds it means you can get more interesting stuff from them so yeah please go and hit subscribe yeah and it's you know it's gotten me thinking it's about your name by the way your yeah, name it's just YouTube, yeah it's just my name you'll find it yeah yeah Jeffrey actually Sibor. is is there a do i have to do anything to get a custom url of my name or is it all i think it's already the the account name isn't it I, i'm embarrassed that i don't know that it's confusing. Like, I, I think you have to set it in the back end on, okay. on YouTube, which I have done. I did years ago. Uh, but yeah, otherwise it just gives you a long kind of 
channel URL that's, you know, okay. youtube.com forward slash sleeve forward slash a long string of random stuff. So yeah, it's bit, <laughs> Question it's, mark, it's nice exclamation can, point. Yeah, a lot, a lot of those. Yeah, definitely a lot of those. <laughs> Looks basically Hash like a, a, long ex, a long expletive, yeah. <laughs> right, right. It's like you're logging into the defense department or something. It's just... just, yeah, just <laughs> yeah. YouTube forward slash really angry something. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, if I can get over that, that thousand mark, then I can... I really can take the bulk of what I do out of Instagram and do it on YouTube and get away from vertical video, which... God, I hate yeah. vertical video. I hate it. I really do. I know it's, 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 you know, it's ubiquitous. Everybody's using it, but I still want yeah, to I'm see, you know, horizontal video. Um, and then I can also live stream some of the paint sessions from yes. down in the studio, which I would prefer to do it on YouTube because then it's persistent and people can ask questions and I can create some sort of community and, and, you know, do a little yep. bit of question and answer and, and, and it's a different kind of engagement, I think. Plus it doesn't disappear after 24 hours. Yeah. That's the other thing is, is it would be there for other people to, to look at and enjoy because I, I really would like to, this is the other thing that you and I were talking about the other day is as I've been kind of revamping my own website, I've been looking at a lot of my work because I'm readying sort of galleries and, and a different kind of presentation of the work. In some cases, it's the first time that I've gone back and looked at some of the paintings that I did a decade ago, you know, and, right. and I'm looking, and again, this is a rare moment, Sean, but I'm looking at the, some of these things and, and this is all kind of on the back of, you know, the emotional kind of outpouring of the last couple episodes and getting out into the world and seeing other people's work and, and seeing kind of where, at my level, where do I fit? You know, where, where do I, how do I stack up, I guess, is, is, is yeah. where I'm at. And I'm looking at, at my work and I'm like, there's some good stuff in here. It's not all good. It's not all bad. But I can see, I can see a progression, which is comforting, reassuring, maybe even inspiring. But I can also see a point of view that hasn't always been intentional but I feel like it's still there. I'm still saying something even when I'm not trying to, you know, consciously say anything. It still comes through. And I kind of love that. I find that fascinating because, like, I mean, it's, it's just so interesting to me that, that from the outside, someone can look at you and your work and see someone, from my point of view, who's always been really deliberate and whose work has always been great. And you're realizing it last in some ways. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I can, I can, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's so yeah, funny, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. I, but I know what you mean. I, some people have had to tell me what I'm doing before I admitted it to myself. You know, you kind of are almost creating it intuitively, not putting too much stock in things, perhaps out of self-protection or something else. Um, and just, well, I'm just doing this little thing. I'm just, you know, it's just this little thing that I do. And everyone's going, no, 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 we can see what you're doing. It's great. Keep going. Like, we really want to see more of that. You know, it's just this little thing. And like, suddenly you wake up and go, oh no, they're right. I am doing a thing right. and I'm doing a deliberate thing. And people have been telling me this for a while and I'm the last to admit it. And I'm the one who's making it. <laughs> like, it's just, it's really interesting to me. Is there some sort of common threat? I mean, cause you and I have, have both spoken to quite a few different types of creators. And I, th I think a lot of people have similar experiences, not everyone, but I think there are a lot of us for whom that's true, where we're kind of the last creative in the chain to go, oh yeah, this is pretty good. And I wonder why that is. Is it self-protection or is it that we don't want to give, is it that we don't want to give what we make that much weight that it has to be, you know, that, that word that we keep coming back to good. It It is for me, it's self-protection. It's, it's, the, we kind of spoke about it last time. It's like the, 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 this idea that we're backing ourselves or two episodes ago, we talked about sort of backing ourselves when we put something out there and call it art, mm -hmm. you know, like you should, we care about it. We made it. So you should care about it too. And I'm telling you, I think this is important and I want you to care. It takes a long time to get there. I think for a lot of us, because most of us are trying to downplay what we're doing because then no one can criticize us because we never said it was art. We never said it was important. So you can't get me right. You know, it's, it's probably, if I'm super honest, the reason why I make sure to put in my bio on Instagram, this is just a scrapbook of ideas. There are some nice images in there, um, and some of them are a scrapbook, but, I, but I, I don't want you to know which I think are important because then I have to stand by them. Yeah, and if you come back and question me on it, I have to have a, a response ready to go. 
Yeah, then I can just point you to my bio and go, I'm not I'm not listening to your critique, it's a scrapbook. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's 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 Diffused. all attacked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now now what are you gonna do? And now right. I can laugh at you for trying to review a scrapbook. Right. But actually, you might have hurt my feelings. Or you might not have. It might have been one of those scrapbook images, but you don't know and I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. But if I if I put together a body of work that I put out in an actual book, I have to stand by that. And and that's the point where I have to get to going like, okay, I, I believe in what I'm doing so much. I'm going to tell you that I think this is good and I'm going to put my name on it. I'm going to put it in a hardcover. I'm going to put big prints on a wall. This is me standing next to my work saying, I want you to think this is good as well, or at least important. Right. Um, and that's that's a hard place to get to. And I think sometimes people who make things, their friends are getting there when it comes to their work long before they are themselves. Right. And I know we think right. this is great. No, 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 it's not there yet. No, no, no. Don't worry about it. Don't look at it too closely. And then you have to slowly get yourself to the place where you get like, yeah, you're right. I, I know this does really matter to me. And I really think it is good. And and I think you're you're arriving there going, yeah, I I do good work. And you do. And, and you have a point of view that I think is more. I, I've heard you sort of say things over the last maybe year. That sort of suggests to me maybe maybe you're acknowledging the themes in your work more deliberately mm-hmm. as you go on. Maybe you're maybe maybe you're even maybe you're even discovering them because maybe it was created out of intuition more than purpose. But actually, your your personality and your point of view and your politics are all coming out in your work in some ways. That that it's just natural, isn't it? Because you yeah. are that human being, and how yeah. could it not? In a way, how could that point of view not come out? Someone else's point of view isn't going to come out, but maybe you're realizing how saturated those points of view are in your work, and that's good. I think that's true. Yeah, and on the back of one of our conversations, I went and looked at some of my bookshelves and some of the books that I have in my collection, trying to distill where some of this has come from. And I have books on Soviet art and architecture and the Soviet space program and propaganda since, you know, World War I and these different periods in graphic design and different painting. So there, there is all of this stuff that's in my reference library. And I think there's a certain amount of that that just sort of filters through me and comes out regardless of where I'm at consciously thinking about the work. Yeah. So I do think that it's a little bit of both, that they're... There is this idea of the source material that we are drawn to, right? The, 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 the types yeah. of photography that we're drawn to, the types of music that we're drawn to. And part of that is, is just some of the things that have stuck with me. I think I grew up at the right time where, you know, I was an adolescent and, and a teenager at the height of the Cold War. And yes, that imagery was everywhere. The threat yes. of, of nuclear proliferation and, and that was all yeah. very real. So on some level, like, how could I not let that filter into the work somehow? You were the, the duck and cover generation. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like that's going to help, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get under this that's little the, three quarter inch piece of plywood. Yeah, yeah, you'll be You're going to be yeah, fine. I mean, this is like a nuclear bunker, your desk that you use for writing in school. Right, It'll be right. Cool. Little spindly, you know, metal legs and a piece of half inch or three quarter inch plywood. All you need. Bullet, bulletproof. Bombproof. You're, you're all good. That's it. Like, That's it. And don't worry about the floor to ceiling windows in every classroom. Those are going to be fine. Nah. Yeah, no, no, no. They're also bulletproof. Yeah. Um, they, but it, I, the way I say it in the book is, is, you know, whatever you make is going to come out of who you are. And, and what you're interested in should come out of your work. And when I hit the chapter on meaning and I use that quote, we talked about it last time about um, the world's the uh, Beekner. Your, is it Beekner? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Frederick Beekner. Yeah. Your, the world's your deep joy and the world's deep hunger where they collide is where your meaning is found. So, so, but that's more than just, Oh, I like painting or I like taking photographs. It's spreading it broader than that. What else do you love? Like what right. subjects do you love? Um, for me, that's why the the films I make for YouTube are full of psychology and philosophy and a bit of spirituality because those are my interests. So I might mm-hmm. love making videos, but I also love psychology. I also love philosophy. So those go into those videos and a collection of things that I love then get presented to the world, hopefully to bring a bit of order to someone else's chaos. So that's, that's I think, what you're doing is you're rolling in. Your that's such interests. a lovely way to put that, bringing order to someone else's chaos. Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of the theme of the book is, yeah, yeah. is, is I think we, that's why we make stuff is we, we make things because we're trying to order the chaos. 
in little tiny ways. It's this kind of like tiny acts of of uh, defiance against entropy. And then, but then when we share it with the world, when someone else sees a good piece of art, it orders a bit of their chaos as well. You know, it it takes maybe their felt anxiety about something. And either it describes the same anxiety so that they get comfort knowing they're not alone, or it gives them an answer to that anxiety somehow. And I think that that's what the best art does for us. Um, and I think what your work does is it it describes the anxieties we all have about the things we prioritize in society and the things that maybe we, we put things uh, on pedestals that we shouldn't. Maybe we order the world in bad ways and we don't make the the important things important. And, and well, that's what I get from your work anyway. That's what it does for me is it describes um, some of the chaos in the way that we're ordering our modern Western world. And I, mm. I, I think that's hugely valuable and it's something you've seen. So you're using your love of um, uh, painting, mixed media design, and you're presenting the world. Designing with paint. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, I didn't. I didn't call you an artist. I didn't commit that faux pas. <laughs> I, I know I get shot. Have to at. pull you back on so, that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You edit it out. Um, so <laughs> there's an odd cut there. You know? <laughs> and um, uh, so yeah, I, I think you're taking your love of that, but you're also taking your love of ephemera and a particular era in history, and you know, you, your connection with that growing up as a child and what you see in society that you think is important and you're rolling all those loves into your art form and then you're presenting that to the world. And I think that's exactly what we should be doing is trying to work out who we are, what do we care about, what are our influences, what are our story, what, what story do we come out of, what's our aesthetic then comes into that and then, and then what's our medium comes into that and then we're presenting something to the world that only we can give. And I think you're, you've been doing that for a while and it sounds like you're you're acknowledging that more and more to yourself, which is exciting to see. I think so. I mean, I, I hope that's the case. And e- even even if it's not, there there is value in. I think there's value for me in exploring the process. I mean, I've talked about some of the earlier work. They're, they're not really being a conscious um point of view or, or, or a conscious direction that I was trying to take with it. It was really trying to figure out the process of working with, you know, bridging that gap between analog and digital and, and learning from other people, uh, who, who were kind enough to, to make their experiments accessible. Um, and it's only been later that as I've been kind of looking through this stuff over the past little while that I go, well, maybe, maybe there was some intention there. And I was either unable or unwilling to see it and, and, and sort of stand next to it. You know, like you were saying before, it's, it's, it's being able to stand next to your work and say, this is what I'm trying to say. And if we, if I, if, if I don't have to say, this is what I was trying to say with this work, yeah. you can't come back at me. It's the art thing all over again. It's, it's, yeah. you can't come back to me and say, well, that's not what that says. You know, you that's can't not get what, me if I don't own it. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. So if, if I just say, I mean, have I told myself this story that I was just doing this, this and this so that I can not be held accountable to whether it is or isn't saying this or whether it is or isn't important or whether it is or isn't art, capital A. I think that's a great frustration that kind of you've kind of reached your limit. It feels like a few episodes ago, even just going like, I'm sick of my own fear. So, so I, I kind of need to call myself on it. And actually I do believe in this and you're almost like, you're, you're more, you're more angry at what, what's holding you back within yourself than you are keen to try and keep yourself safe anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's a great tipping point for artists to reach because then you're like, well, there's no way I'm going to just fade into like non-existence, having not at least admitted to myself, I care about this and given it to the world in a way that I back it, at least trying that, even if it doesn't work and and reaching that frustration point is, is everything for every creator, I think. And I think it's, it's so exciting when people reach that point because you are actually, you know, a combination of like being down there and looking at that work, hearing feedback from friends, going and looking at works of the, of other artists going, I am this good. You know, all those things coming together for you is like, what am I, what am I doing? I have to put this up on a wall at some point, stand next to it and go, yep, that's mine. I did that. And I want you to look at it. Yeah. That, that, and, and there's the realization that, 
I have wasted so much time being afraid. I have wasted so much creative time, potential, you know, potential work that could be out there in the light of day that I have for whatever reason. And I, I'm, I would imagine that there are people listening to this that can relate to this. Maybe you feel the same way. Maybe this is, maybe this is you. Maybe I'm describing what's going on with you right now, that there has been so much time lost to fear yeah. that I now feel like I have to, I have to work at a feverish pace because I'm racing against the clock now, right? There are, there are more days uh, yeah, yeah. behind me than there yeah. are in front of me. And I want to get more of this work out and it doesn't even have to be, you know, I'm realizing that I, I don't have to hold on to that idea of, of good. I, I watched a, an interview with Stephen King. It was Stephen King talking to George Martin, uh, uh, who wrote Game of Thrones. Yeah. And Martin asked him, you know, how do you, how do you write so many books? How do you write? How, how are you so prolific? And um, Stephen's got some good advice from because we've been waiting for his for a while. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and Stephen said that that every day he writes six pages. It is his routine. It is his religion. It is his, you know, whatever you want to call it. He sits down and he writes six pages every day. And he said, so, you know, if a, if a book is 360 pages, that's, you know, X number of days, X number of weeks, X number of months, I can almost bank on that. And then I get to move on to the next thing. Yeah. And I kind of love that yep. because there is an energy in, in working that begets more work. It's, it's exactly how I approached writing my book was, was, uh, I didn't do it by pages. I did it by time. And I said, I had to sit for at least one hour every day and write. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, some days I ended up writing for three. Some days I only did that one hour, but I had to do that one hour, no excuses. Um, and if I wanted to do more, I'd do more. Yeah. And some days I wrote a lot and some days I wrote very little. And some days I had to edit back everything I wrote the previous day. But that that discipline of sitting down and putting something down every single day, even if it's just a little bit, is the only way to get through a long-term project like that. Yeah, yeah. There isn't another way to do it. Because if you only do it when you feel like it, forget about it. That's, that's why so many people say, yeah, I'm trying to write a book at the moment, and then you never see it. Because they only write when they feel like it. Until they turn it into a discipline, you can't get through all the stuff that you write, and then it doesn't feel very good because it's not really what you want to say. And then you just kind of give up because you don't feel like it anymore because it's not exciting. If you don't push through and find the discipline to write the next day after a day like that, and the next day and the next day, you you will give up. That's how, that's how we give up on long-term projects. Mm -hmm. I was talking to Adrian, I think it was yesterday, day before. And, um, you know, I, I, I've been looking for some some other outlet other than the, the, the painting and the and the shows and everything. And the idea of doing Blue is the Collar, which we've talked about a little bit, I wanted to start out that show with the story of my grandmother and grandfather, how they met, because it's a terrific story. Mm. And she was saying, have you have you thought about just writing down some of the stories of your life? Basically, you know, uh, it, not a memoir, but yes, kind of a memoir. And I thought it was kind of a fascinating idea. And she suggested, cause I, I, I said, I would love to, if I did that, I would love to, I, I would love to make it compelling and I'd love to bounce around in time and instead of just having it be a linear kind of experience. And she said, why don't you, why don't you start chapter one with your grandparents meeting and, and the last sort of sentence or the last part of that chapter is, is when your dad comes into the world and then mm -hmm. the next chapter, pick it up on the day that your dad died. So we've wow. got the beginning and ending of his life and then fill in the rest of it with your life. Gosh, that's good. And I thought, yeah, wow, I, I kind of love that. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about it, you know, it, famously uh, screenwriters will often take index cards and and they'll come up with scenes and put index cards uh, one scene per card and put these up on the wall so that they can move things around and and establish a flow and once they've got a flow they'll they'll flesh out those index cards and and that becomes a movie and i thought mm -hmm. it would be kind of interesting to take that same kind of approach 
and and use the various stories that I've remembered or can remember throughout my life and and generate this kind of flow regardless of of what what time period makes sense cuz again I don't want it to be linear I thought it would be kind of an interesting idea I don't know yet but if for nothing else it might be an interesting experiment to see where it goes yeah absolutely gosh I mean you've got to try those I mean like we we don't get great ideas every day like when you when you land on something like that you have to explore it at least don't you hmm. and i love adrian's idea of of bookending Beautiful. the thing with she's a she's a sharp one that adrian I'm telling I you know. <laughs> hang on to that one <laughs> it's it's funny though i mean it's i think you and i are similar in that well maybe we're not maybe i'm making an assumption I think there have been some interesting stories in my life, but I question whether or not an audience would find those as interesting as I do, because ultimately it's a father and son story. And is it, is it just that, and you're the same way about this, we're, we're suckers for father and son stories. Oh man. Yeah. If anything makes me cry in a film, it's, it's a, it's a dad and son moment. I'm finished. Yeah. So is it, is it that this is a good idea full stop or am I just such a sucker for a father and son story that I have to tell my own i don't know no but i don't think you can do that because i it's the same there's a lot of my story in the book i've just written absolutely yeah when, when i when i think about my story i think it's boring and mundane but do you it's really to other people yeah yeah of course you yeah, don't see my, your my, life as 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 interesting and and compelling it's, it's got some interesting details to it and i suppose i've 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 lived a little more in terms of the fact that i've i've had quite a crazy career progression and i've lived in interesting parts of the world but I, I don't i don't necessarily see the things that have happened to me as like very unique or interesting it doesn't feel special or unique to me at all oh my but gosh I, but see, I, I find you you're one of the more interesting yeah. people that i know yeah you but see you but don't see that point. well but no but that's the point isn't it because to other people we are interesting right. but to ourselves we can often see our story as mundane and i think you're the same you might go well i'm not that interesting a person i don't have that much to give but that's not really true because if you if you know how to tell your story well and you do um then it will connect with people and it's not about you know did you climb mount everest it's about can i <laughs> well, that's tell good. you things yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that's fortunate um, <laughs> daddy's knees don't work so well no anymore. not a, not at all not at all yeah. no. um it's not about that. It's about, it's about, can you tell your story in, in the details and in, in the vulnerability of it hmm. that connect with people? So they go, yeah, that's my story too. It, it, you don't have to be different from everybody else. You have to tell your story in a way that, that connects with the common themes that other people have. And you say things that we, this is, this is one of the best pieces of feedback I get from the book is like, you say things in that book that I always knew, but couldn't put into words. Hmm. It's not different to your story. It is your story. I just managed to access it in myself and say it in a way that you hadn't managed to yet. That's the best thing. It doesn't have to be super different. I don't have to be a Nigerian prince or something super exciting. I just have to, I just have to have lived life and have been aware enough of my own struggles and victories that I can say that stuff in a way that you access your own as well. And we all feel like safety in numbers stuff. Mm -hmm. And and everyone can do that. Everybody can do that. It's not, it's not about, I don't think it's about, can I write a memoir that says, you know, cause I could just make up a bunch of super interesting stories and lie to you. I wouldn't make a better. No, you couldn't. Come on. Who are you kidding? <laughs> no, you, I, could, no, you it, couldn't. Somebody else no, might be able to. Integrity but wise, I definitely couldn't, but theoretically right. I could. And I don't think it would make a better book than I've written because, because more interesting than a, than a, than a crazy story is a vulnerably offered true moment that you can identify with. And everybody has that. But I think you've managed to bridge that gap really beautifully. I mean, the, from the opening, that opening scene that you set of you on your back in the bushveld under the stars, I mean, there, there's an exoticness to that. But the experience is something that is relatable no matter where you are. Yes. But the setting that you, that you experience that in automatically hooks me 
You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, and that, that's the kind of romantic part of it that I think that I think I take for granted because I was just there, and it wasn't it wasn't romantic and exciting because it was just me mm-hmm. being in a place, you know. But I think yeah, to someone else, especially people who've never been to Botswana, they're going like, oh, it sounds like. Uh, you know, I've got visions of Robert Redford and out of Africa. It's amazing. Right. It's like, right. Yeah. yeah. Except, except when that's, when you're nine years old and that's kind of all, you know, it's not, it's not as exciting or romantic. It's just my story. It's just what happened, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I do get that it adds a flavor to it, but I bet you if, if, if that had been me sitting out in the desert in Utah, right. I could have written it in a way that would have connected with you as much. Right. The, the location or the place doesn't actually matter that much. It's it's what I experienced, which other people have experienced. The number of people who've got hold of me after reading that first chapter going, I've had exactly that experience as a kid. Oh, I bet. Just that moment, uh, that kind of mind-altering moment where you realize that you're very tiny and the, the, the universe is a very big place. Yeah. And, and I think that's what connects to people. Not the fact that it was in Botswana. The story that I told that everyone else has experienced too. That's the important part. I right. And I think right, that's, right, right. if we find that stuff to put into our work, whatever it is, that's the stuff that people connect with and get the safety and numbers feeling with. And that's where you get a bit of order to your chaos is like, Oh gosh, yeah, that's other people have that. So we're all together in this. That's, that's a beautiful feeling, you know, at the risk of sounding like an absolute hippie. That's exactly what I feel <laughs> like, you know, um, I'm not I've got my hacky sack right teacher. here. I'm going to fire yeah. up some Dave Matthews. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> Crash. <laughs> Little paper. <laughs> <laughs> that, that feeling, I've, 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 there's something I've meant to ask you about, and um, we've got some time. Um, that feeling of being so small that you experienced as a child, how did that, and this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to blow the way I'm phrasing this, but I think you'll know kind of where I'm at. How did that experience compare to finding God or finding that community of believers? Did you feel as small in, in the shadow of God or, or did you feel larger and more significant because you were, you were now part of the club? For me, that moment as a kid was finding God. It wasn't mm. different. That that was what that was. It was seeing my place in the universe, feeling very small and realizing there is so much I don't know. And then, this is going to sound unkind, and I, I don't mean it this way, and apologies for those who do attend church. I think church makes God small again. And I almost had to get back to realizing how big I felt divinity or spirituality was by coming out of the institution because they try and box. I mean, now I think, I mean, this is a super big question, which I can't answer now, but I'd almost define God as, as, as what we don't know, Hmm. you know, because I, I always feel like there's more. And I, even as a kid, I was always a spiritually inclined little boy who wanted to know a lot more. Um, I was obsessed with, with ghost stories when I was, when I was like a nine, 10, 11 year old at boarding school in this old, mansion that was like old convert i basically lived in downton abbey that was that was the boarding school was in one of these converted old country houses so it like we i was obsessed with you know trying to find ghosts there because there must be more than i could see Hmm. and then it was slowly getting involved with with the um with helping out with the services in the little chapel there and because and sitting in the chapel because i wanted to feel more you know i felt like there was always more and then going to high school that was a baptist based school and getting involved with the student association the christian association there um and then leaving and becoming part of this music and drama team because i wanted to find more this god idea and then and then it was going to seminary eventually and getting ordained and and i just don't think god is a is a slightly see through bearded white guy who floats in a soup of nothingness and speaks a word. And, you know, I don't think it's that literal. I think, I think for me, I think for me, God is more force than personality and and more creative force than personality that we get to be a part of as we live life. And, 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 and this idea of, this is, this is digging a little deep. I like the Jewish idea of, of Shalom, you know, this, this word that kind of means, you know, we think means peace, but it actually means more than that. It means it means everything in its right place. So if you think about that, it's like 
It's like things are are working and ordered the way they should be. The the planet isn't being destroyed; it's being renewed. That that feels like the way things should be. Relationships between people are are good and wholesome and not destructive and hurtful. Uh, nations are working well together. Like this idea of shalom is like a wide reaching thing. Everything in its right place are moving towards more order and restoration. That's that's this idea of shalom. And I feel like if I if I consider myself aligned with that divine force it's my job to try and move things towards more states of wholeness and healing with whatever i do with my life that sounds super nebulous and I, and i want it to be that way now i don't want it to be prescriptive or too defined because i moved out of specific evangelical christian religion because i think it boxes god to something that's too small and you have to believe x y and z that i just don't anymore i don't i don't believe it's that specific and so being a nine-year-old looking up at the sky for me that was where that idea started and then i almost went into church and that idea became watered down and small and boxed because that's what institutions do to big ideas because they want to control people and then coming out of church again i was able to read as widely as i wanted to and i could kind of reclaim what i felt was that broad spirituality again that doesn't have to fit into, am I a Christian or a Buddhist or a Muslim? It was able to absorb from all of those traditions and try and see the bigger picture and stay open to things that I don't know. It's the long answer to your, <laughs> to your very simple question. Sorry. That was one of the best answers I think I've ever heard you give. Boom. All right. Good. <laughs> there you go. And it, yeah, I don't know more than that. And I like that I don't know more than that. And I like, I like that I can admit that I don't know more than that. I've been a pastor. You know, I, I am a leader in the evangelical church on paper. Yeah. You're, you're supposed to know more than that as a pastor, aren't you? And do you know what I do? I know a lot more than that. I, I, know, I know enough to walk into any church and have a really good argument with people and pull everything apart. But I also don't believe most of those arguments anymore. So I've, I've, I've learned, and then I unlearned, and now I'm relearning. And, and what I'm relearning is a lot more open-handed. And I, 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 will, I will always protect the ability to keep it that, which is why I won't ever join a group like that again, because I don't want to have to water it down and conform ever. Um, it needs to be that broad. If it's going to be honest, because I don't, there's more that I don't know than I do know. Hmm. Have, I lo have I lost you? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I'd... I, would be, I wouldn't be surprised if I had. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. I mean, again, I, I, it's not where I expected that you were going to go. You surprise me and challenge me and inspire me and confuse me all at the same time. And I'm, I'm so grateful. Oh, gosh, thank you. I mean, honestly, and I've said this to friends back in South Africa who are still pastors in churches and who, you know, very, very worried about me. You know, like mm. I'm, I'm the heretic who, who ran <laughs> off. And, right. <laughs> but I, I say Do to Do they them, call honestly, you and ask if you're okay? Uh, every now and again, I'll get, I'll get little messages going, um, you know, something like, how's your relationship with Jesus? I'm like, you don't want the answer to that. That's question the first question you, out of the gate, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's what they care about because, and, and it's wow. genuine from them. They yeah. think I might go to hell. And if, if you believe that, how could that not be the first question you ask? Yeah, sure. Sure. I mean, I mean, they, they're only doing it because they care. It's just like we don't have the same worldview anymore. But I say to them, I genuinely believe that if I believe, say, in this idea of, of shalom and, 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 and remaking broken connections, I mean, in, in the book, I, I use this idea of religion and the fact that I think religion is a great idea. It's just been awfully uh, worked out in the world that you've got this idea of, of reconnecting things. There's, there's, there's a few different etymologies of the word, but one suggestion is that it comes from the Latin ligare, which means to, to join things together. It's where we get our word ligament from. Hmm. And so if you think of re-ligare, re-ligamenting, it's rejoining broken things. So reconnecting our responsibility uh, towards the environment, reconnecting with human beings, with each other, reconnecting people with themselves and their purpose. I consider what I do now in YouTube and, and uh, writing this book as genuinely pastoral work that that I'm doing religious work just just I'm not trying to convert anyone to anything but I am trying to remake broken connections for people and getting emails from people saying something you said meant the world to me because 
um, you know, I found purpose again, or, or, or I actually reconnected with my dad because you put out this thing about the fact that you connected with your dad again and you, he, you grew up with Adam or, or yeah, I realized that I need to make work that actually helps people, not just makes myself feel better. Like that's pastoral work for me. That's making the world a better place. It's rejoining things back together. It's pulling more shalom or rightness of all things back into people's lives. And and that's pastoral stuff. No, I don't fit into the evangelical Christian church anymore, but I, I feel like I'm doing more important work. And if there is a God, that's the work he wants people to do. I'm pretty sure no matter what tradition you come from. So I, I don't think I ever stopped. I think I just maybe transcended and included the context I was in. Subscribe to Jeffrey Sidoris Everything in your favorite podcast app to get episodes of Deep Natter, Process Driven, and everything else I release all in one feed. If you'd like to support the show and help others find it, you can leave a review or a rating wherever you listen and share it on social media. You can now support what I do more directly by tapping the donate button at the top right corner of my website at jeffreysedoris.com. That's J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S. And thank you in advance. I really appreciate it. You can connect with Sean on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Tuck. That's S-E-A-N-T-U-C-K on his website at seantucker.photography or by searching for Sean Tucker on YouTube. Connect with me on Twitter and Instagram at Jeffrey Sidoris, or you can email me at talkback at jeffreysedoris.com. As always, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time. We appreciate you listening, and we hope you'll come back for the next one.